in our last lectures we have discussed that management is a multidisciplinary concept and we have to know about different disciplines as well as its functional areas like the production system, like the information system, like the strategic management and the applications of certain concepts in management. In today's lecture, I am discussing some of the concepts of management in which I am going to make you familiarize with the concepts which are used in various management uh, uh, we can say um, areas and uh, which will also be part of uh, the course that we are discussing. So, I begin with uh, some concepts, not that you know this is the exhaustive list of all the concepts which are uh, perhaps used in management, but some of the concepts which we are using very frequently and is very and various areas of management. So, so I will just take up one by one number of concepts and sometimes you know you may feel uh, that the list is a bit too long, but then you have to get acquainted uh, with uh, these concepts. So, uh, and, and I have tried to uh, mix you know these concepts uh, of various functional areas uh, and various disciplines of uh, management to make you understand that what are the things. Uh, and uh, we are discussing in management or in, in other words I can say that I am trying to present some sort of a panorama of, uh, of the management uh, concepts or some uh, sort of a uh, scenario I am trying to build for management concepts. So, let us move on. First we are discussing the activity based management and the concept activity based management this uses detailed economic analysis of important business activities to improve strategic and operational decisions. It increases the accuracy of cost information by more precisely linking overhead and other indirect costs using basis such as direct labor hours machine hours or material costs. Then we talk about the competencies as competencies are set of behavior usually learned by experience and are instrumental in accomplishment of various activities. Now, we talk about diversification. Diversification makes good sense as better opportunities are found outside the present business. So, diversification strategies uh, are used. So, that means you know there is a business and you want to make use of your uh, potentials and your opportunities to diversify your business. And so, number of ways one could do that. Let us see what are what are some of these ways. Uh, one is uh, concentrating diversification strategies. We develop new products with the earlier technology for new segments, or we diversify developing new products for new market itself. We can also uh, make use of uh, diversification in, in the horizontal sense uh, using horizontal uh, development strategies where we develop new products with new technology and uh, of course, for the old customers based on the customer based requirements. This brings us to uh, the one of the recent concepts we are using. Uh, in the strategic management that is the balanced scorecard. Balanced scorecard this is this was designed by how you know, one of the professors Harvard professors Dr. Robert Kaplan and David Norton in fact both of them. 
president uh, of uh, resigning solutions and this uh, actually translates the mission and vision statements into a comprehensive uh, set of objectives and performance measures that could be quantified and appraised and this perhaps you know would include uh, financial performance, the customer value performance, internal business process performance, innovation performance. So, all these types of performance that we have listed here are actually included in this. Then we come to benchmarking. We also make use of this term very often in fact in most of the areas that how do we benchmark a particular, uh, particular performance or issue. So, in benchmarking we are trying to discuss this as a process by which a company compares its efficiency and effectiveness on various parameters uh, with that of another. In the same or different industry, we can say even within a, the same industry also we can have the benchmarking. And so, benchmarking has become a very popular uh, concept these days and for any kind of a standard that we want to actually achieve, we have the concept of benchmarking. Benchmarking uh, also implies continuous comparing and measuring an organization's business processes against the, in the industry leaders to collect information that can help the company to improve its performance. Then we move on to business forecasting. When we are conducting any business, when we are having some business, we would certainly like that can we have any kind of a forecasting for our future planning. So, business forecasting is an integral part of the strategic planning and various types of forecasts could be used you know depending upon the, the situations. And some of these are the economic forecasts, financial forecasts, the sales, sales forecast. Uh, technological forecast and of course, there are essentially four approaches. There, there could be many more, but uh, essentially uh, we are talking about uh, some of the approaches which uh, I am just trying to make you acquaint. These are the qualitative approach, the, uh, the where the forecast is based on judgment and opinion and these include the expert opinion, Delphi technique, maybe some of you would like to note down some of these points. So, I am going slightly slow, so that uh, perhaps you know you could, uh, you could note down these points or you could repeat uh, I mean viewing this. And uh, uh, Salesforce, then you have the consumer surveys, the techniques for eliciting expert opinion and uh, a PERT derived technique could also be there. So, uh, this brings us to from uh, this uh, forecasting analysis to another aspect of forecasting that is the quantitative analysis that we are doing. I am taking up forecasting in slightly more details than many other concepts because, uh, because we need actually uh, do a lot in terms of forecasting uh, in, the, in the management studies. So, uh, so, the quantitative approach where forecasting is based on the historical data uh, which could be in any kind of a data, it could be time series analysis. Or, or, or many other kinds of data, it could be a native method, it could be uh, um, the moving, moving averages, it could be exponential smoothing, it could be uh, 
the trend analysis or it could be decomposition of time series, box Jen Jenkins and uh, some other many other methods of course, could be used. These are some of the ones very commonly uh, used by, by um, the uh, we can say not only researchers actually uh, the functional uh, people also in the uh, organizations. Then uh, we also have associative forecast, uh, which includes uh, some of these factors, just simple regression. If you would recollect uh, that in our earlier uh, discussion, we have had a discussion on methodology and where we were also talking about the possibility of having the various types of uh, analysis including the regression uh, analysis and multivariate analysis. So, here the reference is to that. Then multiple uh, regression analysis could be simple analysis could be there regression analysis, it could be multi uh, multiple analysis, it could be any kind of uh, econom uh, econometrics indicators. And uh, when we are uh, looking at the issue of forecasting, this is also based on uh, learned behavior, which we call the Marcos approach. In addition to this, we have the direct methods, which include the market surveys, input output analysis, economic indicators, etcetera. If you would recollect that in our uh, earlier introduction uh, um, sections, number of uh, discussions we have had and we had discussed that there are number of approaches which man management uses and, and the methodology that uh, management uh, in the management we use as a subject. So, some of those uh, we have also sort of repeated here for understanding the forecasting uh, 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 techniques. So, the quantitative models work well as long as little or no systematic change in the environment takes place. When patterns or relationships change, the quantitative approach based on the human judgment is more useful and judgmental forecasting also takes into account the existing trends. But it can identify systematic change more quickly and interpret better the impact of such changes. So, so, we have to understand that if we have a combination of quantitative and qualitative, then perhaps you know we are uh, in a better position to do forecasting. If you are using just a single method, it may not be, uh, be that uh, efficient perhaps we can say forecasting may not be that much dependable perhaps we can say that. So, the choice of a specific forecasting uh, technique of course, depends on various factors and uh, the, these factors of course, uh, you have to de decide yourself and uh, the some of these I am going to mention here that what is the cost associated with the development of forecasting uh, model compared to the potential gains that you are going to uh, get in out, out of this. Okay. In other words, we can, what we can say that benefits realized uh, uh, which we can outweigh the cost of uh, uh, implementation. So, if we are trying to, uh, uh, to make use of any technique, uh, we have to understand that how much cost is involved uh, in that. And uh, otherwise, uh, we may use a technique, but, but uh, that uh, uh, may become so expensive in terms of uh, perhaps all resources, all types of resources, then uh, it may not be advisable to use that particular, uh, particular technique. So, uh, another issue that we have to take up here is that how complicated are the uh, rela uh, relationships. Okay, that are being uh, forecasted. 
see in certain tangible sense forecasting may become very easy but uh, uh, if you are looking at the thing you know in terms of uh, um, other resources and uh, where the gains are intangible their forecasting sometimes you know becomes a little more complex uh, more much greater a challenge perhaps now we have to see that how complicated are the relationships as i said just now and uh, also we have to see whether we are looking at the forecasting in long term or short term so so in fact the whole uh, forecasting strategy as we are trying to understand has to be designed very carefully and then how much accuracy is required in that because sometimes you know we may do with uh, uh, with uh, larger amount of error perhaps but sometimes we need things you know to be very very accurate so uh, um, and uh, on th that's the issue that i have discussed uh, is there any minimum toler tolerance uh, level of errors in forecasting so uh, from here we move to understand the uh, next concept so we have discussed uh, quite a bit on the forecasting issue i have devoted some more time you know on this because i thought uh, forecasting becomes ex an extremely important con um, concept for management and so uh, so maybe some a few um, concepts appear in which we aren't really discussing so much but forecasting we have devoted some 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 time now uh, coming to uh, the um, the issue of industry structure and in fact in our uh, discussion on organizations which is coming up just uh, just after one or two lectures you will find once uh, we will be discussing the industry structure once again the types of uh, organizations so industry structure when we say uh, uh, that that relates to the concentration economics of scale product differentiation and barriers to entry uh, uh, some of the important factors which determine the industry structure we'll be talking um, uh, about industry structure in fact the structure of organizations types of organizations in, later in one of the lectures then uh, we have the competitor analysis analyzing competitors is an integral part of strategic strategic planning in uh, identifying their firms current and the potential competitors executives must consider several important variables and uh, some of these variables are listed here the scope of the field customer orientation commitment identifying uh, the, the milestone in the development of the strategy and uh, this brings us to the next concept that is the business process re-engineering we call it BPR and these days uh, uh, you must be aware of the fact that we are looking at business process re-engineering as an important consideration <coughs> excuse me so business process in engineering this involves the radical redesign of core business processes to achieve dramatic improvements in productivity cycle times and quantity in bpr organizations start from the scratch and rethink the existing processes to deliver more value to the customer that means we can rethink about the existing situation and we can re-engineer that to the best benefit that you know we might get uh, in the in the times to come because the the world is changing in fact uh, and that's going to be one of the discussions in our course on the change process so business process uh, engineering is very much related to the the issue of management of change which will be taking up later in this course so company uh, so in this context we have to understand that companies reduce organizational layers they might because if they believe that now see as uh, we know that uh, the organizations are becoming flatter earlier they were taller organizations and uh, this is this is uh, because of so many reasons which we'll discuss later 
So, so the companies sometimes you know may reduce organizational layers, they may eliminate uh, unproductive activities into cross-functional teams and these are some of the aspects using information technology uh, to improve data dissemination and decision making process. So, uh, from here we also talk about the capacity expansion. In capacity expansion, we have talked about diversification earlier and here we are talking about the capacity expansion of an organization. Obviously, the reference here is to the manufacturing organizations largely we can say that, but management uh, does not only uh, is not only limited to that, but, but uh, since many examples you know come from the industrial organizations, so some of these are uh, related to that. So, uh, any major uh, capacity expansion uh, is a strategic decision again and when firms add capacity, they may not be able to utilize their capacity fully. Sometimes you know it may so happen that you are not able to, to actually uh, utilize your capacity or sometimes you feel that whatever capacity we had, we would like to expand because of so many reasons including the market demand or your perhaps the own organization has become very, um, very much you know uh, perhaps developed. There may be a number of reasons for that. So, uh, not only adding capacity is, uh, is uh, risky, but you know sometimes the competitors may also do so and the gain uh, in, in a large market share. Okay. So, the risk factor also we have to see that the risk associated with capacity expansion is largely due to uncer uncertainty in this regard. And uh, as we will see later that the capacity expansion uh, ha has to be done, but we have to make that analysis all, all the time. So, any major capacity expansion is a strate strategic decision as we have seen earlier and when the firms add capacity, they may, they may not be able to utilize the capacity fully and as uh, we have talked about later. So, the future demands are important, the future prices of inputs are important, technological adva advancements are important and uh, so, so many other uh, factors like reactions of the competitors uh, and, and that is important. So, we have to see that impact of, uh, of industry capacity expansion, um, I mean how, how we, what kind of in impact that we may find on, on this capacity expansion. So, number of, so in, this becomes again a strategic decision for an organization. So, this brings us to uh, the, uh, the issues of capacity uh, expansion in terms of that how narrowly, how narrowly it is applied to the manufacturing uh, of an organization. In many business organ, uh, manufacturing is trivial and non-existing capacity may, may be there. So, so, how are we actually applying capacity expansion that becomes very important. Capacity ex, uh, expansion is also narrowly applied to manufacturing and many other businesses. So, ac so, activity needs to be understood in terms of investments made in most of the critical areas of value chain. So, uh, so, so what we are trying to understand is that the capacity extension is actually the activity of the whole organizational planning. Thus, the in the pharmaceutical industry for example, if you are taking just one example, the capacity uh, has to be defined in terms of a scientific manpower or uh, sales force or in a so software company, perhaps software development company, we have the capacity that has to be understood in terms of number of programmers employed. So, uh, so, every organization perhaps you know will uh, need uh, different types of uh, analysis for capacity expansion. Industry uh, over capacity is one of the uh, important risks. 
in which the companies you know have to consider while expanding their individual capacities. See what happens if you have uh, over uh, perhaps you know non employment, then there there is a possibility of dysfunctional energy. So, sometimes the uh, if you have the, um, too much capacity in machines, machines may re remain idle. So, so we have to actually calculate all these. So, neither the manpower nor the machine capacity, uh, uh, not the, the other capacities perhaps, you know, we have to really optimize on those, if we have to really make good management strategies. Uh, so, uh, as we have seen that industries over capacity could also become a risk and the risk of excess capacity is particularly high in commodity types, the uh, types of uh, business. In such industries, uh, since the products are not differentiated and firms tend to add capacity to generate you know the, the economies of scale, sometimes uh, we uh, may not be calculating it you know very efficiently. So, the capacity expansion uh, sometimes you know may not be as uh, efficient as expected uh, uh, perhaps. So, there is a high uh, capacity risk also in this. So, how do we really strategically calculate that? That's, that's very important. Now, uh, the, the in uh, these risks, risks are also high when the capacity cannot be increased in, uh, in the incremental uh, amounts, okay, but only in big lumps. So, that all depends on the the kind of technology that you have, the kind of business that you have. And over capacity may also happen in some industries. As, as I just now discussed, you know, the number of issues and about over capacity. Now, this may be characterized by the sig significant uh, uh, learning and curve advantages or as long as the lead time is added uh, is adding to the capacity. because. The excess capacity uh, might usually result into uh, into uh, into some some uh, difficulties, as I was just now talking to you about. And when there are many players, uh, perhaps you know uh, we can say uh, that the market leaders, uh, then the firms will actually continue to to uh, to expand, okay, indiscrim indiscriminately. But then there may be problems you know sometimes. So, the capacity expansion that is a very interesting uh, and important uh, um, perhaps term concept in management, but uh, we have to see how much of capacity expansion has to be done. See all these concepts let me repeat it here once again that all these concepts I am trying to just familiarize you with these concepts, because when we are taking up each topic, then once again these concepts in might appear there. There we may just you know give you this idea and then we move on. So, if you understand these uh, some of these concepts, then uh, for you it is going to be better in terms of understanding uh, management studies. This brings us to the next concept, the co-determination. This is a concept maybe some of you uh, for some of you this is a very new term. Co-determination that is a part of uh, participative uh, management. In fact, uh, we are going to have one lecture or maybe more than one maybe two lectures on participative uh, management all over the globe. And uh, co-determination is a type of participative management. This is a, a type. And this is a kind of management system that requires uh, co the cooperation of uh, the representatives of labors, employees and trade unions on the board. And this system is prevalent in the European countries like Germany and Netherlands. In fact, most of the East European countries we have um, uh, talked about the co-determination as, uh, as, as one of the techniques. Uh, these countries uh, have a, a dual management system consisting of 
two boards, namely the management board and <coughs> the supervisory board. The management board has the executive responsibility. For example, the management board uh, uh, in, in Germany, for example, then the one example that I have uh, decided to discuss here. Suppose that has 11 members and the super supervisory board that has 20 members of which the members, the employees are the uh, representatives. And uh, these representatives uh, actually decide the affairs of the company. And uh, in fact, you know, they have uh, the decision making power just like the perhaps, you know, we have in, in our country uh, almost, you know, very close to the decision making top decision making bodies that we have. And the major objectives of co-determination is to protect the interest of workers in the firms. However, there are uh, downsides as well. Interference in the uh, labor unions, this may, sl uh, this may slow down the decision making process. But that then at, as that happens in the whole participative management situation, it may sometimes slow down the process, but at the end uh, of it, uh, perhaps it is always, uh, always uh, um, advisable to use that, because that gives a greater satisfaction and greater ease, you know, at the place of work. Uh, so, I have de decided to discuss about, uh, say, two hours, uh, two, um, two lectures, I have decided to give you on participative management as well, which will come, you know, during the course of this. Um, this particular course. So, uh, uh, from here we move on to another concept. Am I going very fast? Is it? Am I going very fast? Is it? Any questions you would like to ask me about any of these concepts? Yes, please ask me some questions. Okay. So, we move on to the next concept now the core competencies. A core competence is a company's specialized capability, which is largely embodied in the collective knowledge of its people and the organizational procedures, which hope the way the employees interact. So, this brings us so, so, do you understand the core competencies? So, each one of us, you know, may also have, you know, some core competency, and every organization has some core competency uh, that, that they have. We will be talking about it also in details uh, when we are looking at some of the other, uh, other um, chapters later, ok. Then the next point I would like to discuss is the, uh, the issue of ethics. We all know that no successful organization um, can really uh, be seen without the organizational good values and ethics. And here I am trying to just, even though this is going to be another lecture for us, we are going to, uh, uh, to uh, discuss this in much greater details. So, here we are looking at the corporate code of ethics. Uh, as corporate uh, conduct comes under increased scrutiny for both shareholders and regulators, there is pressure to create exemplary codes of conduct, which promote good conduct by setting a common standard by acceptable behavior. Corporate code of ethics defines the company's code values and the guiding principles. So, when a, a company is working, we need to understand what is the code, what are the code values and what is the code of ethics. And in fact, some codes are very common. Okay, perhaps across most of the organizations and some may be specific to certain organizations. When we are discussing the values and ethics in organizations, we will come to, uh, come to these issues. 
then the governance, the issue of corporate governance becomes uh, extremely important. Corporate governance has been a very hot issue in these years, in these the years of 2000s. I think his slight, there is a slight error here. Okay, it doesn't matter. The uh, series of corporate uh, okay uh, standards involving uh, environment. Um, or or the um, other, other you know issues this has become an extremely important factor in the uh, the uh, the governance of an organization and when we are looking at the governance governance we are looking at the environment we are looking at you know so many so many other issues you know which might you know bring results for art so the corporate governance is the subject that deals with interaction of managers, directors and shareholders uh, and uh, we are talking about directors are expected to safeguard the interests of the shareholders by monitoring the actions of managers and on the other hand you know the managers also have to show their responsibility uh, in, in the overall corporate governance. Here, uh, see in between uh, when I am explaining a particular concept more than perhaps some others, uh, I have taken some examples to make you understand. In the United Kingdom, the importance of good corporate governance, uh, this was brought about by the public attention after a series of corporate collapses and the scandals in the 1980s and 1990s. The effectiveness of the board of directors, uh, this was highlighted following the publication of the Cadbury Committee report in 1992 and the code of best practices was established. So, although it is voluntary, all the listed companies are, are expected to actually comply with it and since the Cadbury report a number of other committees have, have uh, established the best practices uh, in the specific areas like it could be many like directors pay or it could be many many other uh, issues so the the uh, all these issues are taken into consideration now very close to the issue of ethics um, that we were talking about is another uh, term that we use in the management studies is the corporate social responsibility uh, this is the how much the uh, responsible corporate social responsibility an organization has and in fact in today's time when we are looking at uh, particularly with the globalization we are looking at that every corporation must also abide by its uh, social responsibility so today there is a pressure on the companies to go beyond profits see earlier we were talking about and in fact also when we were talking about an introduction uh, we had put you know profits as one of the important parameters at least for the industries but then today even the industries have to go beyond the the issue of profit towards safeguarding the interests of various stakeholders both inside and outside the organization uh, so, the, in the insiders are typically the uh, stockholders and the employees of the firm and the outsiders are the other individuals or the groups affected by uh, the actions of those firms. So, when we are looking at the, the issue of corporate uh, um, social responsibility, that means, you know, this is rather away from the exact main uh, manufacturing process, how the organization is looking at its corporate social responsibility that is the issue here. So, each firm regardless of its size must decide how to discharge its perceived social responsibility and there are number of uh, issues, there are number of approaches and uh, different approaches are adopted by different organizations and different uh, approaches adopted by different firms they reflect the differences in 
uh, their uh, competitive positions in uh, in uh, industries and country uh, environment and the ecological and perhaps you know the pressures that mean they might have today as you know most of the uh, most of the people are aware of this fact that any industry that is doing very good business also has a uh, social responsibility in terms of not depleting their ecological environmental uh, scenario and and uh, this, this this is one of the uh, again you know the issues of uh, management uh, which may look like you know as if it's away from the boundaries of your your organization but then you know you're part of a society and so so uh, so so as a management expert perhaps you, know, you can't say that i will close my eyes to the corporate social responsibility that uh, cannot be done and so this has become this is becoming a great uh, uh, the issue of importance in fact uh, in fact a movement in other words they will reflect both situational factors and uh, differing uh, priorities and the acknowledgments of the claims that others might have so, uh, so the corporate social responsibility becomes an important factor again uh, in our uh, uh, lectures we have one lecture on the corporate social responsibility then we come to the critical success factor critical success factor refers to those few critical areas where things must go right for the business to flourish when we are talking about industries at this point that if an industry has to flourish it has to uh, go uh, beyond a particular um, particular uh, success factor for example the ability to control freight costs is critical success factor for uh, perhaps a computer or software company we can say yeah. or uh, similarly we can say the ability to design freight costs is a critical success factor for manufacturer of of steel so so there are many many such examples just a couple of examples in which i am discussing here so th but that's an important factor in the overall process of managing this brings us to yet another concept that is culture short while ago we were talking about that management studies is a multidisciplinary concept and that has lot to do with uh, with the social factors and also lot to do with overall cultural factors so the culture refers to the knowledge that people use to interpret the experience and the beliefs and values of employees which form the core of the organizational culture if we are suppose borrowing some technology we are doing some uh, collaboration so so the culture becomes uh, important factor there if we have the different kind of a culture something we are borrowing from another country then we have to see that the performer who is you know from this country is he able to adapt to some of the requirements of the organization so culture refers to the knowledge that people use to interpret this experience that's what you know we have talked about and this makes the organizational culture and uh, this issue has been uh, studied by hofstede uh, one of the uh, management thinkers who has worked in the uh, worked you know in many areas including the uh, the his work is well known in uh, in uh, the area of uh, psychology value related okay so he has talked about the cultural values the social values uh, all over the world and he is a famous dutch scholar and he is uh, has talked about values 
in terms of the four well known dimensions of culture, which is said that their culture is characterized by the power distance, uncertainty avoidance, individualism and masculinity. And he has done lot of work in this area, uh, which uh, again you know will, will form part of our discussion in one of the lectures which we may have. From here, from the issue of culture, we move to customer relationship management. Some of us believe that okay, we have manufactured a product and that is the uh, perhaps the best product and that is the end of it, but actually not. Just like the corporate social responsibility, we have to go, we have to go actually uh, uh, beyond the boundary on, of our organization. We have manufactured, but we have to do the marketing and unless you know we have good marketing strategies, we uh, perhaps uh, may not be that much successful. So, the customer relationship management, which we can briefly say CRN is a process which companies use to understand their customer and manage, manage them uh, uh, with the uh, most profitable uh, way. Okay, we, we can design a system where we can, we can actually manage them within that uh, most profitable way and CRN may increase profits by improving customer uh, retention, offering programs and better customer uh, related uh, service. And see, if you have a good customer, you should try to retain them rather than becoming, uh, becoming uh, mm, very indifferent to them. Okay. So, that has become an important aspect of managing. So, here we are coming to the another aspect that is the double loop learning. I am taking actually, I am presenting a scenario. So, I am trying to acquaint you with a, some kind of a panorama of uh, the uh, the concepts of management. So, some concepts I have tried to pick up, you know, from, uh, from the production management, some from the human resource management, some from marketing management and, uh, and uh, some from strategic management and so on. And I have to put, I have tried to put them in you know, some kind of uh, alphabetical order, but not necessarily that all the concepts are here uh, in, in the alphabetical order. So, so let us see now the next concept that is coming up for you is the double loop learning. Double loop learning is a process in which learning is perceived as a continuous loop where the learner gives the feedback to the learning process and corrective actions are taken to, mod to modify the system in order to make it uh, more effective. In fact, you know this concept becomes you know extremely important when we are looking at uh, um, the uh, the issue of HRD and uh, when we are trying to make corrections, we are trying to give feedback or trying to actually uh, actually trying to uh, give training. Uh, uh, we are dealing with the issue of training and development. Okay, so th these factors become important there. Now with the the uh, um, advent of see the new ideas and the new companies working and new competitions coming up with globalization. Another issue that comes up uh, as a strategic issue for us is the issue of downsizing. Many companies are downsizing because of many reasons. It could be, it could be um, also the, the kind of technology that you are using now. So, perhaps you can downsize. So, in the face of uh, slowing or decline of course, uh, is one of the factors, but technology could also be another factor. So, in the face of slowing or declining sales, the companies often reduce their employees, uh, employee base to cut the costs and downsizing is a common phenomenon in many organizations, but I am adding that 
in addition to this, uh, sometimes you know, because of new technology, we don't need so many people. There's a new system, so we don't need so many people. Even at that time, we have to uh, go in for some kind of a downsizing. That I'm adding, you know, from what what I've just captioned, I've just shown you here. So just that idea I had not shown there. So the uh, the economic value that has to be added, you know, for the uh, for most of the things when we are looking at a tangible gain. And here, what we are uh, trying to look at that the economic value added, which we may call as EVA, this measures the value creation to shareholders by a company or business unit. The analysis measures the ability of a company or business unit to earn more than its total cost of capital. This from here we move on to talk about the concept of emotional intelligence. Some of you might think that the concept of emotional intelligence is important. Let us see what is the meaning of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is about moving people in the desired direction and there are number of components of emotional intelligence which is self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy and social skill. So, we uh, will discuss about the other issues in our next lecture and we will begin with the environmental scanning. <laughs>